Summer goes far too quickly in my garden, but while the long warm days are almost over, the harvests certainly aren't. And I'm really pleased with the way things have gone this year. So join me as I show you round the garden to see what's worked, what hasn't, and most importantly, what I've discovered that will help me next year. I know a lot of you will have had savagely hot summers, but here it's been decidedly cool and damp for much of the summer, although now it's starting to warm up at last. Now the cooler weather has benefited some crops, such as these brassicas around the garden, while others have taken a bit of a back step, like the corn here. The cobs are beginning to fill out, but they've got a little while to go yet, but I think they will get there. The beans, on the other hand, well, they have really thrived and they've been pumping out these pods like mad. Last summer, it was incredibly hot and the beans really struggled and got very, very threadbare by this time of year. They were pretty much over. They love lots and lots of water and I struggled to keep up with their demands. But this year, on the other hand, they have just absolutely loved it. Now, the variety of runner bean I've got here is called Lady Dye, and it's a stringless bean, which means, as it sounds, you don't get sort of big, long strings. It's much more ten tender and delicate. What that means is that even if the beans do get a little bit on the larger size like this, they're still quite tender and good eating. And that's a lesson to be learnt, actually. Look out for varieties described as stringless because they'll stay tender for longer, well worth seeking out. Once things start to slow down in probably just a couple of weeks from now, I will let these beans kind of mature into seed so I can save them for next year and trim the old seed bill. Now this is an open pollinated variety, which means that the seedlings that are grown from the saved beans should come true to type. The dull, wet weather wasn't great for my tomatoes. They were here. They'd grown to a nice height, put on loads of growth, and were beginning to set fruits when, bang, the old blight came in and struck them with a hammer blow. Hugely disappointing. I didn't have anything to salvage, just completely exhausted. Every setback is an opportunity to learn something new. And the lesson here is that it's probably worth growing blight-resistant tomatoes outside. Now, blight-resistant tomatoes aren't fully, fully resilient against blight, but they can put on new growth and push through. So that's what I'm going to be growing next year. I don't think also this area has helped. It's relatively enclosed and so the, so the air isn't quite as free flowing and moving. We've got the overhanging branches of the apple tree, the bean arch here, and I just think there probably wasn't quite enough airflow. So next year's tomatoes will be grown properly out in the open. It's always a shame losing plants like that, but never mind, I've gone in with my sprouting broccoli a bit earlier and I've planted them in amongst the marigolds which I've left to continue adding their cheer drawing in the beneficial bugs that make our jobs as gardeners so much easier. The second half of summer is a really important time of year because that's when many follow-on crops are planted. Now they follow on from earlier crops such as say garlic, fava or broad beans, early varieties of roots and many salads. And it's great to do that because it means you can get two crops in one year from the same growing area. Other follow-on crops include my Asian greens and some other winter salads that are now ready to plant, my beautiful kale, and this bed of leeks here, which follows on from an earlier crop of potatoes. I've got my chard in here, and despite the odd nibble, it's actually establishing really nicely. My squash patch here has turned into a bit of a jungle. There are developing fruits in there somewhere, but it's hard to see them with all this sort of triffid-like growth. So my plan here is just to leave it be, and then once the cold weather whacks back the foliage in a few weeks, it should reveal the fruits, and I can get on, gather them, and cure them. Zucchinis or courgettes, on the other hand, are summer squash, and these guys need regular picking to keep them coming. Look at that. And there's some smaller ones here with the flowers still on, which are great for sort of stuffing. Let's grab some of those. Going to grab a few beet roots as well while we're here. And then a few carrots. Look at these beauties. 
There's a riot of colour in the veg garden too. There's nasturtiums spilling and tumbling here, there and everywhere. There are borage flowering from a, an early summer sowing. And then I've got these beautiful sweet peas which feed the soul just as important. There's poached egg plants and of course those beautiful marigolds. The flowers really add so much to the garden. It's very tempting just to dedicate the entire area to vegetables and herbs, but adding in these blousy bloomers really does attract the pollinators and also the beneficial bugs that help to keep pests at bay. So it will be more of the same next year. My second cropping potatoes came up beautifully and I have been pinching off a little bit of blight I've noticed, but I just can't keep up with it. And it looks like this whole area is toast, unfortunately. I think next year I will grow blight resistant potatoes as well. But the opportunity is that I've now got some free space to plant some spring cabbages, which were looking for a home. To be on the safe side, I'm gonna move these autumn cropping potatoes that I planted last month into the safety of the greenhouse. This will help to avoid them getting the blight because they will be protected from the spores blowing around in the air. Any kind of cover you can give your uh, potatoes or tomatoes would help with that. They'll also benefit from the extra warmth in here as things start to cool down. Incidentally, while we're here, have a look at these guys. Now, these tomatoes, as you can see actually, did get affected by blight and are still um, ongoing with it, but they've seemed to have powered through with all of this fresh growth. Now, I thought, what's going on here? So I checked the variety name, it's called Crimson Crush, and that variety is known to show blight resistance. So this is actually a really good case study of what I can expect in future seasons. Something I'm keen to add to the mix next year, new, is uh, some grains, perhaps amaranth and quinoa. I was really inspired this summer when I visited Chef Gaz Oakley's garden to see his grains. They seem quite easy to grow and they are prolific, so it makes common sense to make space for them in my garden too. Now, if you missed my tour of Gaz's garden, I really can't recommend it enough. He's got such a lovely garden down there. So please do have a look at that and I will pop a link to it below. Now these cucumbers were bought quite late in the planting season. They were on discount and rather straggly looking things. But I thought, well, let's pop them in. And do you know what? These straggly little plants found their way up the strings here within about two weeks and started pumping out these uh, cucumbers within another two weeks. I've been so impressed. All cucumbers ask for in return is plenty of water. They're thirsty plants. Now you'll notice here there's a bit of powdery mildew creeping in and it's the end of the season which is, is kind of typical for these plants. I've managed to keep it at bay for quite a while though by simply spraying on a kind of milk solution. It sounds crazy but there's something about the proteins in the milk which helps to uh, put off the mildew and I can say it honestly works combined with lots of water. This is quite a stubby variety of cucumber, but if you've got a long variety, then I have a little tip for you when you're harvesting them. If you don't have much space in the fridge and you just want to add uh, to harvest it ad hoc, then just slice off what you need and then just leave the fruit on the plant and the end here will callus over, ready for your next harvest. A great way of saving that fridge space. Here in the greenhouse, I've got a beautiful selection of tomatoes planted as young plants bought from the garden centre. Sometimes impulse buys are the best. They had dozens of varieties available and I challenge any gardener to try and walk past a temptation like that. So I sampled some from this pick and mix of varieties and planted eight different types here. And we're gonna pick some, lay them all out, and give them a bit of a taste. And here they are, these beautiful varieties. I've got a nice mixture here of cherry types and uh, main sized tomatoes with these lovely striations. Let's start with this one here, which is like a zebra type tomato called, uh, called Shimmer. It's got these beautiful striations down the side. Let's give it a little taste. Oh wow, a real kind of richness, sweet, but also savory notes, slightly tangy. This would look absolutely stunning in any salad arrangement. We'll try one of these. I've had these before. These are super, super sweet, these uh, cherry types here. This is um, Sweet Aperitif, well named. It's just got a kind of golden honeyed taste to it. This one here is really dark. Look at that. It would be 
full of really good stuff because it's that dark. It's called Black Opal. It's lovely to have a sort of dark tomato like this. Mmm, just an explosion of juiciness. It's kind of like a safari, uh, safari journey for the taste buds here. Absolutely glorious. To be honest with you, I've struggled to keep up with the harvest of all these tomatoes. So I thought, well, why not process some of them into a very simple tomato sauce? And this can be turned to just about anything. Now the paste tomatoes that are full of pulp, they are the best ones for making a sauce. But to be honest, you can turn this recipe to just about any tomato you've got. Just whack it all in there and it'll all boil down and create a lovely, rich and unctuous stock. So I've got them in here, all chopped up a bit. Now I'm going to just apply heat from the bottom here and then gradually, sort of as it starts warming up, mash it down with this uh, potato masher here. And the idea of that is I want to sort of liquidate everything, get all the seeds and skin out because that'll give a much smoother, uh, much more delicious tomato sauce. I'm not going to add anything to this, no salt, no garlic, no herbs. And you think, oh, what kind of a sauce is that? but it's just going to give us a really basic tomato, I guess passata. So I'm going to just strain it through here. If you've got a food meal, this will make this whole process so much quicker and easier. And you can see the juice and pulp coming through, but just to help it through, I'm going to use the back of the ladle. That's a nice lot of juice. This is the real essence of summer, isn't it? Look at that. So there you can see we're left with just the skins and seeds. Now I've just got to put the juice and pulp back in the pan and we're just going to boil it away on a lowish heat until it reduces by about half and that will really condense those flavours and intensify them and then it'll be good to package up. That's it, perfect. It's got a really kind of smooth and silky texture now and it's really definitely intensified. Just give it a little taste. Oh wow, that is so intense. So now I'm just going to let this cool down and then just decant it into Tupperware or other plastic containers, label it and pop it in the freezer. If you want to save on freezer space, then you can obviously can this. And if you'd like to know more about canning your produce, then I will pop a link to our video on that down below. And I've saved some of these beautiful cherry tomatoes for our harvest truck here. And let's get ourselves a cucumber too while we're here. And there, what an incredibly handsome harvest hall we've got. Just magic. Over here, I've got my little basil collection. I've been growing five different types with a variety of leaf uh, shapes and colors. There's a couple here that are my highlights. This beautiful purple basil, doesn't that look stunning? And, uh, but my favorite, I reckon, is this Greek basil here. It grew the fastest out, fastest out of all of them. And it's got these really fine, tiny leaves. I think it's really pretty and it's gonna look great with my tomatoes that I've harvested. Also, just for flavor here is this beautiful lemon basil. And I wish you could smell it, but it really does have a, such a, a sprightly citrusy tang. Oh, just so gorgeous. And I've also got some exotics, or exotics to me at least, some lemongrass, turmeric, and then ginger as well. And I'm really looking forward to releasing a video on the surprisingly varied world of gingers quite soon. In the meantime, hop on over to this video for an early summer tour of my garden to see how much it's come on since then. And please let me know in the comments below what has been your proudest achievement this growing season. I'll catch you next time.